Hi, this is Dr. Claire, and this is our lecture on the global ecology. So now we're stepping out even further away. We've been kind of stepping out from population ecology to community ecology to ecosystems, and now we're getting into global ecology. Um, so what we're interested now in is the whole Earth itself, and that is our biosphere. We have uh, exactly a sample size of one for any study of the biosphere because we have only one planet. Um, and so we know how things are on this planet, other planets may ex be experiencing different sets of these things, and if we ever find life on, a, on another planet, the biosphere of that planet may greatly affect the life on that planet. So when we're talking about the spot biosphere, what we're talking about is um, all the living communities on the planet and the patterns of, in which they are distributed. So these, these patterns of life on the planet are affected by things like nutrient availability, solar radiation, um, atmospheric and oceanic currents. Um, so all of these play a role into uh, where you find different types of life on the particular, on the planet. So we're going to start by talking about nutrient availability. Um, there are very, various uh, very important critical nutrients that uh, are on the planet, and they cycle uh, through um, bi biotic and abiotic systems um, and become available for organisms in various different ways. We've actually already talked about one of these nutrient cycles, the carbon cycle, so I'm not going to go over that again, but I am going to go over the nitrogen cycle and the phosphor cycle really quickly here. Um, so the nitrogen cycle is really important because uh, nitrogen is a, a necessary compound to build proteins and, um, and DNA. And without nitrogen, you can't be a living organism. Um, so you need to have some sort of nitrogen. Now, most of the available nitrogen on the planet is found in the atmosphere. Uh, the atmosphere is about 80% nitrogen gas. The problem with nitrogen gas is that it's very inert. It is a two nitrogen atoms that have a triple covalent bond, so it's very stable, it's very hard to break down. Um, and there's only uh, one group of organisms that can turn nitrogen gas into a form of nitrogen that is bioavailable for other organisms, and that's prokaryotes. So there are bacteria, nitrogen-fixing bacteria, that are able to break that um, triple covalent bond and turn um, nit nitrogen gas into things like nitrates and, and ammonia. So uh, <clears throat> it's a really important process, and that's where all the, the bioavailable nitrogen is coming from, is these nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Then once you have those nitrogen-fixing bacteria, nitrogen can move up through the food chain, so it's built into plants. Uh, plants can get it from the soil where the nitrogen-fixing bacteria, some of those plants actually have associations with those nitrogen-fixing bacteria, like legumes, peas, and beans, and things. Um, and so the nitrogen gets built into the plants, then the plants get eaten by animals, and it passes through the food chain that way. Um, animals do excrete nitrogenous waste. That's usually pretty bioavailable as well, so plants can make use of that. That's why spreading uh, fertilizer, for example, is a really helpful way of uh, getting nitrogen to plants. Um, <clears throat> but sometimes it gets broken down, it returns to nitrogen in the atmosphere. So you have this cycle where it moves between biotic organisms and um, into, the, uh, into the atmosphere. Um, phosphorus is primarily found in the Earth's surface, um, and so producers can actually uh, accate, uh, access that, that phosphorus directly from the soil, um, build it into their tissues, and then that is, uh, go, goes up through the food chain into the, the, into the consumers, into the animal life. Um, it cycles pretty rapidly within the ocean, so it's constantly moving between um, photosynthetic organisms in the ocean that are taking it up and then into the animal life in the ocean. And then when those um, organisms stop, break down, they re-release re it back into the ocean. Some of it can be trapped into the sediment, which then goes back into the crust, which can be released um, again into the soil. Um, so a lot of these nutrients are what we would call a limiting factor. So both nitrogen and phosphorus can be a limiting factor for, for ecosystems. What that means is that there's not enough bioavailable nitrogen or phosphorus for all the producers to utilize. Um, so the producers are actually limited by the availability of those things. There are other limiting nutrients as well. Um, <clears throat> in a lot of aquatic ecosystems, iron is actually a limiting nutrient. Um, iron is necessary in very small amounts for, uh, for the algae to grow in the oceans. Um, and so one thing that happens that's pretty interesting is that when there are dust storms in the Sahara Desert and iron-rich iron dust is actually blown out over the ocean, you have this huge bloom of algal growth because they weren't able to grow because there wasn't enough iron, and then the dust comes out. That provides the iron that they need, and so they grow and reproduce very rapidly. 
Um, this can, you can also see this in aquatic ecosystems with nitrogen and phosphorus when you have runoff from fertilizer from agricultural fields into aquatic ecosystems. A lot of times that'll cause these big growths of algae in those ecosystems. Um, so it's, a lot of times there are these limiting nutrients that um, prevent further growth of primary productivity. <clears throat> Another really important um, factor in terms of where organisms are found on, plant, on the planet is the uh, amount of sun exposure that any particular part of the planet um, gets. So the sun, uh, when it's shining on the planet, right, uh, if you're on the equator, the sun's coming in pretty much at a right angle. So, so here's the land mass at the equator. Sun's coming in. You get a lot of direct energy, um, and so there's a lot of solar energy at the equator. If you go up towards the poles, the 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 Earth is a glo a sphere. So as the as the you go up towards the poles, it's at an angle away from the sun. So the sun's light comes in. And the same amount of sunlight is hitting us a larger area. So the sunlight is less strong towards the poles than it is towards the equator. Um, so there's more energy available to each unit of land mass at the equator than towards the poles. So you, you tend to see um, more primary productivity towards the equator than towards the poles. This also has a, an effect on the climate. It tends to be cooler towards the, towards the poles because, again, you've got less of that sunlight energy coming in and striking the ground. And so that um, has a big influence on the temperature in those regions as well. Now because the Earth is not um, at, a, at a straight 90 degree angle to the Sun, we're actually, the axis of the Earth is actually tipped, and what that means is that we have seasons. So as the Earth circles the Sun, that one of the poles or the other is going to be actually pointing closer to the sun than the other one. And so um, that's what gives us our seasonality. So when it's summer in the northern hemisphere, it's winter in the southern hemisphere. And when it's winter in the southern hemisphere, or sorry, summer in the southern hemisphere, it's winter in the northern hemisphere. So that gives us that, that cyclical pattern um, that as the Earth rotates around the sun. So another consequence of the, uh, of the sunlight striking the Earth is that the sunlight will actually warm the air as it strikes. And the greatest amount of warmth is going to happen right at the equator where the sunlight is striking the Earth at a perpendicular angle. So that air right along the equator gets very warm, warm air will rise, and so it rises up. And um, as it rises up, it will pull air from both north and south of the equator towards the equator. So you've got um, winds that are blowing t from north to south, so northerly winds getting down to the equator, and southerly winds heading up to the equator, okay? Um, and so then the air rises up at the equator, it travels both northward and southward in the high altitudes, and then sinks back down at about 30 degrees north and south. Um, as it sinks back down, it's going to spread out along the Earth again. So you tend to have, if we're looking at the northern hemisphere, at about 30 degrees north, you have um, air that's going to be blowing generally northward from 30 degrees north, and air that's going to be blowing generally southward from 30 degrees north. Um, now, at the same time, the Earth is rotating, right? And the Earth rotates from east to west. Um, so if, as if we look at where we are in North America, and we're north of 30 degrees, so the air is moving generally northwards from that 30 degree mark. At the same time, the Earth is rotating underneath that air, right? And so what you get when the Earth moves underneath that flow of air is a general uh, northeastern movement of that air. So that's called a westerly wind. It generally blows from the west to the east. That's why it's called a westerly. Um, and so it's generally going to move westward across the continent. And that's why most of our weather is going to be coming from the west. In other parts of the globe where the air is moving south in the, south, in the northern hemis hemisphere, you tend to get easterly winds because of the earth spinning underneath that, that body of air. Um, and that, so that controls the, uh, the overall air currents on the planet. So you get these patterns of air currents that are roughly cyclical. Now when those air currents interact with our oceanic basins, um, you tend to get these giant uh, gyres of, of uh, water. Um, so the wind is blowing over the water that tends to cause these water currents and because the wind tends to be blowing um, easterly, so from east to west along the equator, you tend to see currents in that direction along the equator and then because the wind is blowing westerly uh, 30 degrees north and south of the equator, you tend to see west currents 
in those regions. And so you have these, um, these giant uh, swirls of water in each of the ocean, ocean basins, which are going clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. Um, and that's where those currents actually come from. Um, and this whole process of the, uh, of the interactions between the, the warming air and the rotating earth is what we call the Coriolis effect, and that's this, this, these patterns of, of currents that we see. Um, now, those currents, air currents and water currents, can lead to a patterns of precipitation on land. So if you have a prevailing wind direction, if you have, say, in uh, North America, winds blowing in from the west, so they're coming onshore on the Pacific coast, um, say in Washington, you have this, this, this air coming off the ocean, it's got a lot of moisture in it, and it comes up against the Cascade Mountains. And as it hits the Cascade Mountains, that air has to go up and over. As it rises, it cools, and as it cools, it releases moisture. And so you have a whole bunch of moisture that comes down on the west side of the Cascade Mountains. This is where we have our temperate rainforest, huge amount of precipitation. This is why you always hear about Seattle being rainy, and it is. It rains there all the time. Um, and so all of that moisture is coming out of the the atmosphere. Then as it goes down the opposite side, the air comes down, it gets warmer, and so you have what you call a rain shadow. We're actually in a rain shadow here on the front range. We're in the rain shadow of the uh, Rocky Mountains, and so here on the front range it tends to be relatively dry. There's less, there's uh, relatively little precipitation compared to some other places in the, in the world. Another factor that influences the, the patterns of life on the planet is actually elevation. As you go up in elevation, it's basically similar to going northwards, if you're in the northern hemisphere, or towards one of the poles. Um, uh, you, as you, each, for each thousand meters you increase in elevation, you tend to have a, a, a temperature decrease of about six degrees Celsius. Um, and uh, seasonal differences. And so you tend to see these patterns where um, habitats that are found uh, very far to the north or south near the polar regions um, will often um, extend down mountain ranges into more southerly regions. So if you go up into the mountains here in Colorado, our, our spruce fir forest that we see uh, at higher elevations here in Colorado is really similar to the spruce fir for, for forest that you'll see at lower elevations in places like Canada because the, climatically it's very similar. And so all of these interacting patterns um, uh, will will lead to various different biomes. Now these biomes are uh, general uh, habitat types that are very similar across the world. So you can have things like desert, which has very tends to be very dry and very hot. And deserts are found in in different regions of the planet, but you see similar species living um, in each of those regions because they're adapted to a similar environment. Um, I'm not going to go over all of the different biomes. Your book does a good job of that, so go ahead and look at your book to kind of get an idea of uh, what the different biomes are on the planet. Now the last factor I want to talk about in terms of understanding our global ecology is actually humans. Uh, we are a global species, we are found everywhere throughout the world, and we have a really big impact on our environment. Um, so uh, I'm going to go into the effect of humans on the environment more in our, our final section here on, um, on conservation biology, but um, it's something that uh, needs to be kept in mind because we do have a really big impact on the planet. Alright, that's it for today, I'll catch you next time.